I often get questions about how to measure voltage with microcontrollers. We will look at this topic, at the quality of built-in and external analog to digital converters, and I will show you some secrets. So let's start. Grüezi YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent, with a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. Remember, if you subscribe, you will always sit in the first row. Voltages are analog and our controllers are digital. This is why analog to digital converters, short ADCs, became so important. They are the heart of digitalization. The opposite, by the way, are digital to analog converters or DACs. They create an analog voltage out of a digital number. In this video we will see how ADCs work. Look at how we can determine the quality of ADCs. Compare the ADCs of different microcontrollers with external chips. Learn how to tweak the calculations to get the best out of any ADC. See how we can extend the range of ADCs. Discover some hidden things of microcontrollers and their ADCs. Look at different external boards and their usage. In the pre-digital age, transistors or even valves were very expensive and big. So many different ADC converter principles were invented and used to save such components. Today, with our silicon technology, we do no more need to optimize for parts. This is why a few exotic principles were left behind. Today, we mainly use these two principles. Parallel comparator ADCs and successive approximation ADCs. Let's start with the parallel comparator ADCs. They are fast, expensive and not too accurate. Fast means they can convert signals up to gigahertz, which is crazy if you ask me. Their main turf is software-defined radios and other extremely fast processes. If you are interested in what software-defined radio is, you can watch video number 286. But how do these parallel comparator ADCs work? They are quite simple and consist of only a few parts. The first is a stable reference voltage. This part, by the way, is vital for all ADCs. Then they divide the reference voltage into many voltage steps. Let's assume for simplicity we want to build a 2-bit ADC with a voltage range of 10 volts. Then we divide the 10 volts into 4 steps of 2.5 volts. We can do this with a simple voltage divider where we cut one resistor in two. Like that we get voltages of 1.25, 3.75, 6.25 and 8.75 volts. We now connect one input of a comparator to each of these voltages and connect the second input to the input voltage. It is quite apparent what happens now. A voltage of 2 volts, for example, is bigger than 1.25 volts. So the first comparator triggers, and all others not. At 8 volts, 3 of 4 comparators trigger. Immediately when we apply the voltage. If we add a few gates, we get the 2-bit signal at these pins. Of course, all comparators have to read the signal at the same time. Otherwise, we do not get accurate numbers for changing signals. This is why we apply a clock to all comparators. Its most significant disadvantage is scalability. For each additional bit of resolution, we have to double the numbers of comparators. A quick calculation for a 12-bit ADC shows 4096 comparators, including the precision resistors and all the connections. I would call this a nightmare for a chip designer. And here we can discuss another important topic, resolution and accuracy. If we have a voltage of 1.3 volts, we get a 1. If we apply 3.7 volts, we also get a 1. We get such a staircase and see that this ADC has a resolution of 2.5 volts. So it would not be suitable to monitor a Lyon battery, for example. We would need more bits to get more steps. For this calculation, I assumed that the resistors and the comparators are precise. 
Let's assume this resistor is a bit smaller than the others, or this comparator does not switch at precisely zero volts. Then this switching voltage would be smaller and we would get a 2 for the 3.7 volts, which would be wrong or not accurate. You see, there is a difference between resolution and accuracy. Resolution automatically increases with the number of resistors and comparators. Accuracy depends on their quality. Both are cost drivers for chips. The more resolution or the more accuracy, the more expensive. Not to forget speed, which is also a significant cost driver. The same thing applies if the reference voltage, for example, is only 9 volts. The resolution would still be the same, but the accuracy would be miserable. Do you think this is theoretical? Then look at the datasheet of the Atmega328 used in Arduinos. They use VCC as a reference, and your USB power supply never delivers precisely 5 volts. Now we defined the voltage range, the resolution and the accuracy of an ADC. The next important thing is speed. It is quite evident that for this ADC it mainly depends on the speed of the comparators plus the speed of the logic gates. As said before, parallel comparator ADCs go up to a few gigahertz. An example is the AD9208 which covers up to 3 GHz. Not bad. Also, the price of $1700 for one chip is not bad. You definitely pay attention to what you do if you work with one of those. One remark. If you read the datasheets of those fast ADCs, you often see DBFS and not milli or microvolts. This is because RF engineers mainly work with DB. Now we leave the expensive world of parallel comparator ADCs and continue with successive approximation ADCs. Their function in a way is very similar to what we saw before. The input signal is compared to a reference signal. What was done in parallel before is now done sequentially by only one comparator. Therefore we have to supply it with an ever-changing reference signal. And it takes longer. Let's assume an input voltage of 2.5 volts. If our reference voltage starts at 0 volt and increases slowly at precisely 2.5 volts, the comparator changes its output signal. If we knew the reference voltage, we would know the input voltage. Simple. If we use a DAC to create the reference voltage, we know of course which output voltage it creates because we apply the digital value at its input. We just have to transfer this value to the output pins and ready is our ADC. Nearly. As before, we have to make sure that the value of the input signal is stable during the whole measurement. Otherwise, the result would be wrong. And, as said before, the measurement takes quite long. This can be done by a sample and hold circuit, which is mainly a capacitor and a switch. The switch is closed till the ADC wants to read a value. And because the switch is closed, the voltage of the capacitor tracks the input voltage. As soon as the switch opens, the voltage at the capacitor stays fixed. At least if we make sure that we do not discharge it with our comparator. Another problem is quite apparent. If we assume we have a 12-bit ADC for 10 volts, and the input voltage is 9.9 volts, the resulting digital value would be around 4050. Our ADC would have to make 4049 wrong tests until the comparator would switch from 0 to 1. You can imagine this would be extremely slow. Fortunately, we can do much better. We can start with 5 volts. The 9.9 volts are higher. So the next value to test is 7.5 volts. Still not enough. Next 8.75 and so on. You see the principle. Instead of more than 4000 tests, we will end with maybe 10 tests. And this is basically how these ADCs work. Just out of curiosity, I show you how a typical DAC works. It has a similar voltage resistor network 
as the parallel ADCs, with two main differences. The resistors are arranged in a R to R ladder, and instead of a bunch of comparators, we need a bunch of switches. This network creates a voltage that is proportional to the binary value applied to the switches. You find a link in the description if you want to do the calculations. In the end, an amplifier is added and ready is the DAC. And of course, also here, a voltage reference. But how about the resolution and accuracy of a successive approximation ADC? The same applies here. The longer the latter, the more resolution of the DAC. And with it also the ADC, of course. The accuracy is mainly determined by the accuracy of the DAC and the comparator. Most of the ADCs we use in our projects are of this type. To save money, we can even go a step forward and add a switch in front of the ADC. Like that, we get 4, 8 or even 16 inputs. Cool! But pay attention! These chips only have one ADC and therefore can only convert one input at a time. So their speed is divided by the number of analog inputs. Now we know the important stuff about ADCs. Let's apply this knowledge to the chips in our lab and start with the Arduino Uno. The Atmega 328 has an 8 channel 10 bit successive approximation ADC. So it is the type we saw before. One ADC and 8 inputs. It has a pin for a voltage reference. But because this pin is not connected on the Arduino boards, VCC is used as a reference, which for sure is not optimal. The Arduino has a built-in voltage reference, but only for 1.1 volts. With some tricks, as shown in video number 10, you can increase its accuracy using this reference. If we divide 5 volts by 1024 available steps, we see that the resolution is 4.9 mV. The smallest difference we can measure is around 5 mV. Its accuracy is around 2.2 LSB, which is 2.2 times 4.9 equals 11 mV, with an external voltage reference. Without it, it can be much higher as we will later see. Its conversion time is 65 to 260 microseconds, which is in line with what we learned. Slow and depending on how fast it hits the right value. Now we go on with the ESP8266. It also has a 10-bit ADC without multiplexer, so it has only one input. And essential, its initial range is only up to 1 volt, which is vital to know. Fortunately, many board manufacturers extend its range to 3.3 volts. How is this done and how can we use it to extend the range even further? They use a simple voltage divider like this one on the VMOS D1 Mini. It reduces the voltage by a factor of 3. Let's now assume we want to measure 24 volt solar panels. For sure, we want the margin and set the maximum voltage to 30 volts. We use a voltage divider like that. At an input voltage of 30 volts, we want an output voltage of 1 volt for the ADC pin. This is the formula and if we enter the values, we get 2.9 mega ohms. Minus the 220k already there, we have to add 2.7 mega. And the VMOS should show the right value. Of course, it will not display the proper value because the resistors are not precise and maybe we do not have the exact value. This is why we use a mapping formula. We first apply 30 volts and note the value measured by the ADC. Then we insert this value into the formula and get adequate values. The same principle can be used for all other microcontrollers. I probably would not try to measure above 50 volts with this simple method because it can become dangerous for humans. And of course, it only works for DC and not for AC voltages. Now we go on to the ESP32. It also has its secrets. It has two different 12-bit ADCs with a total of 18 channels. Their quality gives rise to discussions in my last video. Many people complained about the inaccuracy of this ADC. The datasheet has quite a lot to say, which usually is not good because the manufacturer adds exceptions and prerequisites. 
We will see if this is true when we later test it. Also keep in mind that the ESPs have quite a strong RF signal very close to the ADCs. This can easily influence its readings. This is why specifications are done with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth off. If you encounter issues with the readings, my first step would be to switch off all radios and test again. Another trick is used in the specifications, the addition of a 100 nanofarad capacitor. This also reduces noise on the analog line. But of course it also reduces measuring speed. Talking about speed, the maximum is 2 million samples per second, which translate in a conversion time of 0.5 microseconds, which is much faster than the Arduino. Maybe this is partly responsible for the inaccuracy? Unfortunately, this is not all. In a small and casual post, Igor mentioned the fact that all 10 pins of ADC2 cannot be used if we use Wi-Fi. So it only has 6 pins left, GPIO32 to GPIO39. Fortunately, some boards connect GPIO 36 and 39 to sensor VP and sensor VN. So they should also work with Wi-Fi. On AliExpress, we find modules with external ADCs. The most common one is the ADS1115 breakout board. It has one 16-bit ADC with four input pins and it is connected via I2C. Its sample rate is 860 samples per second maximum. And it has a specialty, a so-called programmable gain amplifier, short PGA. It can be used to increase the resolution for smaller voltages. We find a bunch of data about the currency in the data sheet. And from the discussions before, we can now understand most of it and see that this chip plays in another league than the integrated ADCs. Of course, you get other ADCs like the PCF8591 or the AD7705. The PCF8591 is only 8 bits, but it also has an 8-bit DAC. So, if you want to control something and measure the result, this might be a suitable module. The AD7705 also is 16-bit, but only has two input channels and is connected by the fast SBI bus and is primarily used for the digitalization of fast signals. Let's now check the different ADCs out. I have here an exact voltage reference which can produce exactly 2.5 and 5 volts. Let's start with the Arduino Uno. At 2.5 volts it displays 496 to 498, which is plus minus 1 LSB. But is this correct? We map the values with this formula and get mostly 2.5 or 2.51 volts. Not bad. But now I increase the supply voltage of the Arduino to 5.2 volts, which is still in the USB specifications. Now it shows only 2.4 volts. At 4.8 volts supply voltage, it shows 2.6 volts. Interesting, but of course, not good. If I power the Arduino with 7.5 volts at the barrel jack, we get quite constant 2.51 volts. So either you power your Arduino at precisely 5 volts, or you watch video number 10, where I show how you can use the internal reference to stabilize these values. Next is the ESP8266. It definitely is less stable and has glitches from 829 down to 821 but it is faster than the Arduino. So I average across two values. Now we get fewer glitches. If I average across 10 values, we still have glitches. Even if I average across 100 samples, we still get an unstable signal. But at least we get two digits stable at 2.67 volts, which is of course wrong. You saw now one way to reduce noise in a signal by averaging. And you saw how simple the average formula is. We quickly can correct the wrong voltage by adjusting this parameter to 3.09. Now we get the desired 5 volts. The chance all other measurements are also correct is high. So let's check it with 1 volt. Yes, 
one volt is also okay. Of course, not more precise, but at least no gain error. We corrected it using this method. If I connect the A0 pin to ground, it should read 0 volts, but it reads 0.01 volts. This is the small offset error, and we correct it here. Now it reads 0 volts. Of course, we should have corrected the offset before the gain error. With averaging and the calibration formula, we get at least the maximum out of a particular ADC. As promised, we want to extend the range to 30 volts. The added 2 times 1 mega ohm resistors are sufficient, and the factor is 31.8. Now, our VMOS D1 Mini can measure 30 volts. Not bad. Let's look at the ESP32 and do the measurements. The raw data looks scary indeed, but let's look at what we can do. If we average across 100 values and adjust this factor to 3.61, we get a consistent 2.5 volts. Of course, we have to adjust this number to the 12 bit of the ESP32. Average over 1000 values creates a quite stable 3 digit number. But when we go to 1 volt, we see the non-linearity of the ESP32 ADC. It only shows 0.9 volts, nearly 10% off. So this ADC has a high resolution of 12 bits, but because it is very inaccurate, this resolution is useless. Now we use a real ADC chip, the ADS1115, connected to the ESP32. We see it is much more stable and it has 4 bits more resolution. Impressive. Of course, it is also much slower. If I average across 5 values, we hardly see the noise. But we do not need averaging here. It is good enough without. Only the fourth digit moves a little. I removed the offset and adjusted its values to precisely the value of the 5 volts reference. Of course, we have to adjust this number to the 16 bits of the ADC. And the linearity at 2.5 volts, it shows 2.4994, right on the reference. Overall, this ADC is much better than all the built-in ADCs tested before. Summarized, we saw how the most used ADCs work and learned to determine their quality. Compared the ADCs of an Arduino Uno and two ESPs and saw that all of them could not be used for serious work. Because of their low quality, we could apply some tweaking to improve the results. We also extended the measuring range of a WeMOS D1 Mini to 30 volts. We discovered that the Arduino reacts on fluctuations of VCC and how to avoid it. A tiny comment of Igor revealed that we could not use most of the ADC pins of the ESP32 because they are used for Wi-Fi stabilization. We tested an ADS1115 external ADC board and saw that it has superior quality compared with all the internal ADCs. And it became clear that we have to use external ADCs for serious work. One last thing. This is my nicest looking ADC in the lab. It has 8 parallel channels and is quite fast. As always, you find the relevant links in the description. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. Thank you. Bye.